Good evening and welcome to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with you on a Tuesday night alongside broadcast partner Alan Dinkinson. For the next 60 minutes, we'll be talking sports and sports betting. Dink, of course, a Las Vegas-based sports betting pro and a wrestling promoter. In fact, he's got a card coming up this Saturday here in Las Vegas. We'll talk all about that. His featured guest on tonight's program is going to be on that card, one of the biggest Angels fan. West of the Mississippi. Dink, good evening and welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Good to be here. How many Angel fans are there east of the Mississippi? That not, might be bigger. <laughs> not many, but there are plenty of Angel fans in California, especially now that the Angels have won six straight. They're pulling away in the American League West. They're gone. Eight games clear of the Oakland A's. Their magic number after tonight is just 10. Hard to believe what the Angels have done to the A's in just a month's time. The A's did a lot to the A's, too. They've lost a lot of games to a lot of bad teams. I saw a price at CG Technology about a month ago. A's minus $4 to win the American League West. That's how um, much control they had of the division. But, uh, boy, the Angels, they lose Garrett Richards. and yet they lose probably their second-best player. And yet still on a roll, uh, winners of six straight. How about the last three games for the L.A. Angels, too? Three games in three cities. They played in Minneapolis, Cleveland, and Arlington each of the last three days. They won those three games by a combined score of 35-10. to 10. Our featured guest tonight is Joey Ryan, a very popular in pro wrestling circles in Southern California and elsewhere. And he'll be here in Las Vegas on Saturday for Dink's Wrestling Card. Before we chat with Joey, Dink, quick a promo for that card Saturday. Where does it take place? And how much it, does it cost to uh, to watch? It takes place at the uh, Las Vegas Roller Hockey Rink, which is in the Commercial Center, and the kind of the back of it. The Lotus of Siam is on the front of it. I mean, once you get in there, you won't miss it. But it's in the far back. It's uh, it's an interesting little venue for wrestling. It. Uh, doesn't have chairs, which I'm bringing in. Uh, it has a PA. It, it's a, it's a little bit uh, non state of the art, I would say, but it makes for a good visual and it's cheap. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you mind, don't mind me asking, what's the venue cost and what about the wrestlers? Uh, are there heavy fees there? Well, we have about five fly-ins, which cost more than their the work. People say they only make a couple of hundred. That's unbelievable. And then you think, well, they're only working one twenty-minute match, so it's not the worst pay ever. Um, but you could argue that it's a lifetime of work for them. I mean, you've, you're paying them for what they've done already. It's not just the tw- it's like the break. right. But it, this is like I pay pretty well on the independent screen, and it, you know, it's I'm not going to make money, so that comes into the equation too. If I was making thousands, I would be much more generous with the payday, but I'm definitely going to lose money. And I think most promoters lose money for a long time before they start making money. Joey's a part owner of uh, PWG, and uh, they almost closed their doors after six years, and finally they've got the recognition they deserve. Joey Ryan, good evening. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the EOG Sports Hour. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to have you, Joey. T- tell us a little bit about your wrestling background, your introduction to pro wrestling. I see that you started uh, your wrestling debut came in the year two thousand. Yeah, almost actually almost fourteen years ago to the day in September of two thousand. Um, I uh, trained in San Bernardino, California. I started in February two thousand. I had my first match September of two thousand, and uh, just kind of went along for the ride. You know, first it was part time, you know, a weekend warrior kind of thing, and uh, at some point i got good enough or i got recognized enough or it turned the corner where i started being able to pay all my bills with it so now it's full time for me what um what attracted you to wrestling were you a wwe fan as a child yeah i actually uh you know i have three older brothers so um you know i got into wrestling at a very young age and um definitely like in the height of like hulk hogan and hulkamania and all that and you know and then when i was in high school it was kind of when uh you know, like the NWO came out and like The Rock and Steve Austin were big in WWE or WWF at the time. So like, you know, a good, like influential time in my life, wrestling was huge. Um, so, you know, I was obviously still a fan just growing up with it. And then, um, you know, and I was actually at a WWE show when I got a flyer for an independent show, which uh, was the first time I'd even, even heard of independent wrestling. Um, I didn't even know it existed. And, uh, you know, and sometimes I decided to, t- to go watch that show and 
upon further investigation, found out there was a wrestling school, and then went and took classes. Kind of just kind of all happened one one moment after the other. Joey Ryan is our featured guest, professional wrestler from Southern California. Did you model your career after anyone, Joey? Is the are there wrestlers from the past whose qualities you admire? Um, yeah, I mean, well, growing up, I was you know obviously a big Hulk Hogan fan, um, and then. When I got a little bit older, I became like a real big Shawn Michaels fan. And then when I actually started wrestling, um, you know, I, I kind of took the more. I mean, obviously, Shawn Michaels is a great wrestler and, and, a, and a great showman. Um, and Hulk Hogan's a great showman, and some would say a great wrestler if, if for what he was meant to do. Um, but you know, when, when I started wrestling and started seeing like the techniques and the abilities of certain guys and the way they could, uh, you know, tell a story, whether their role was big or role was small, I started. Uh, getting interested in guys that were more, a little more technically sound, guys like Lance Storm and guys like uh, Jamie Noble, even like from the past watching old tapes of Brad Armstrong, guys that maybe didn't have as much recognition as, as my favorites growing up, but guys that were, you know, they, they knew their job and they could get their job done. And, and they, I really took to them because, uh, you know, I thought they were a little bit underrated and I really liked, uh, you know, their what they brought to the table. Um, and, uh, yeah, and just, yeah, and I used some influences, uh, you know, obviously, I grew up. Uh, like I said, I got into wrestling very young um, with my older brother. So I, you know, got got uh, grew up with it in the '80s. Um, you know, late mid to late '80s um, when I really became a fan. Um, and so when I started wrestling, uh, you kind of you kind of feel like there's all these rules you have to follow to you know follow in the footsteps of the guys that came came before you. But really, when you realize that it's a show and there's no rules and you can kind of do whatever you want. And present yourself however you want. I decided that I wanted to be kind of a, a wrestler out of the the style that I grew up watching, and um, so I just made myself as much an '80s wrestler as possible, um, with the look and the style and the the attitude, and and because I didn't, I thought everybody was trying to get too modern with like trying to implement like a, a, a hybrid of UFC and wrestling, and you know trying to do make things more realistic, and, and I just wanted to take a step back from that, and I was like, I'm going to be over the top. And dramatic and, and and corny and cheesy and cartoony like the '80s wrestling, and that's how I kind of came up with the character that I do. Did you start out as a face because you have a face look? I think until you until you put on your sleazy, you know, costume, sleazy attitude, sleazy ring gear. Um, I'm guessing you started as a face. I didn't know you back then, of course. I was in yeah, New no. York, so <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, when you first come up in wrestling, it's a lot easier to be a face because it's 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 a little bit harder, like to um, to get people to care enough to hate you. Um, if, if that makes sense, um, as a as a baby face, it's, it's easy to try to appeal to fans. Um, um, but you know, because like as a as a heel, it it I mean, not not in every case, but it could be more a finesse about getting a crowd to to hate you with like still like like love to hate you, you know, kind of thing. Um, where they're still in. in Enjoying watching you wrestle without, without hating you for hate, you know for being terrible. Um, so um, yeah, and then you know honestly, like like I said, I tried to be as big an '80s character as possible, which uh, which you know a lot of the times if you like I, I modeled myself not not after a wrestler um, in the '80s, but I looked at like an icon of the '80s, and so I kind of chose Magnum PI because you know he kind of was okay. everything that was cool about the '80s was Magnum PI. But if you see somebody who looks like that nowadays with the mustache and the chest hair and the short shorts and the Hawaiian shirts, you kind of think, oh, man, that guy's sleazy. But, like, in the 80s, he was the biggest good guy there was. But if you see him today, if you see someone that, with that same exact look today, you might be a little more, you know, leery of him. So so even me just trying to um, imitate the biggest good guy in the 80s I could made me look, at least, uh, you know, from a visual standpoint, as a, a bad guy of, of today's terms. Tell us about. I know you've worked WWE and TNA. Tell us about some of your matches. Who are, who are the bigger names that you've wrestled in the? Um, you've been all over the world. So who are the biggest names you've wrestled? Um, yeah, I've done some WWE matches with the Big Show and and uh, Mark Henry. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think who else was in that that, li- that list. Um, um, John Morrison. I did when he was in WWE. Um, and again, when he and was then, not, probably right. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, geez. Um, and then TNA, uh, you know, I wrestled uh, Rob Van Dam, RVD, he's a big name. Um, you know, from ECW and TNA and WWE, um, obviously. 
he might be the biggest one. Al Snow, too. Al Snow had a good run. Yeah, the feud with Al Snow. We love Al Snow. I did have a feud with Al Snow. Um, That was fun. Yeah, so, I mean, those are kind of probably the bigger names that I wrestled well. Chavo Guerrero, you know, one of the Guerrero family. Tell us about some places that you've wrestled outside the country. Oh, uh, yeah, I've wrestled in um, uh, France, England, Germany, um, Canada, Mexico, uh, Australia, India. Um, just, you know, for different reasons. And, uh, like the India one was for the Rinka King promotion, which was on television out there. Um, so we, you know, I was out there for a couple of weeks at a time, just filming TV. Um, and then the other ones were just, uh, independent bookings for, uh, you know, different reasons, different companies that wanted to use me in my character on their shows. And this week you're wrestling in Las Vegas and where are you wrestling next week? Uh, this week I'm wrestling in Las Vegas, uh, actually probably Las Vegas and in Southern California on Sunday. I got to make a quick turnaround trip because I got yeah. another booking in Southern California um, on Sunday. And then next week, uh, my executive partner Kenneth Ray and I were going to uh, England um, for three shows on the 19th, 20th, and 21st in Sheffield and uh, Kent. I think is the other place. I, cool. I have to look at the flyer to, to know for sure. Um, but yeah, so we're doing uh, and then. We come back home and we have some more, uh, some more stuff in you know stateside. That the That's Joey and Candace thing have really taken off. Um, I think you do a lot of great publicity with that. You have a YouTube thing, uh, Candace and Joey show, which I believe has fifty nine episodes. Yeah, you know it's like it's like a road diaries thing. You know, I just bring the camera out whenever, whatever show we're at, whatever city, whatever town, whatever state, whatever country we happen to be in. Um, you know, I bring a little portable camera with me and I, I just film footage of just the different wrestlers on the show or even just the, uh, us walking around the city and just the different sites. And it's I've really seen kind a of lot cool. of footage of Disneyland on the uh, Joey well, the yeah, and Joey we live, in, we live in Southern California, so we frequent Disneyland a lot because, you, know, you know, we're professional make-believers, so we, uh, we have that, that kid spirit in us. I um, like that. That's very cool. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly and Alan Dinkinson. Our featured guest tonight, Joey Ryan, professional wrestler from Southern California. He'll be here in Las Vegas on Saturday on Dink's wrestling car that we'll tell you about later in the program. Um, we talked about it earlier, and we'll tell you more about it later. Biggest payday for a single match, Joey, and what about the uh, biggest crowd you've wrestled before? It won't be this Saturday, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did a show for WWE at the Staples I think it's 20,000, so that's probably the biggest. Uh, 20,000 um, 20, for the Staples Center match. Yeah, yeah. I, did, well, I mean, one of the WWE shows I did, um, you know, they, they tend to sell out the buildings that they're in, especially when they're for, you know, in town for TV shows. Um, Staples Center might be the biggest venue I've wrestled for them. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I think, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what, I'm, I would be a guess off the top of my head for mm-hmm. the Staples Center. Um, but they sold it and it sold out. So whatever sells out the Staples Center. Um, and I misconstrued that for the payday. So what was the biggest payday? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that's 20,000 seater. I'm talking about the, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the biggest payday, uh, some of the TV stuff I've done, like, uh, uh, like for Rinka King and, um, and things like that. I've, I've maybe done a thousand maybe for a match, um, depending on how big it is and how many, um, uh, um, how many sponsors there are for it and you know what's it being used for and you know what rights am I signing away to it like if I'm giving up complete rights to whatever um, but that's very unusual that's not a usual thing that's that's few and far between for that much um, nowadays because of my TV exposure um, I follow somewhere between four to six hundred a match and um, Joey's generally. a friend and, and he helps me with my promotion and he doesn't yeah, yeah. expect uh, a paycheck from me, although he'll get a small one always. But, you know, he's doing right. this as a favor, and that's great. It's something I want everybody to know. Mm-hmm. And does uh, come out to support that event this coming Saturday. Uh, Joey Dink often talks about the love affair between PWG wrestlers and uh, the crowd that attends those matches in Southern California. There's something special happening there. Uh, yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's very uh, interactive with the, the, the fans and you know it's in a small building and you know it's, it gets to be standing room only and the crowd i think the key the connection the crowd feels is they feel like they're very much a part of the show like um you know one of the things as wrestlers one of our strongest suits is being able to improvise and uh you know being able to you know there's, there's definitely you know a script and a choreography to what we do but uh 
at the same time, you know, we we have to go off script or we have to improvise with our surrounding and our environment. And a lot of times, you know, the fans' participation, whether it's them chanting something or yelling something, or or you know, uh, them them wanting to see something that maybe we didn't have in our initial script or our initial planning. Um, and we're good. We're really good on the fly with that, and the, the crowd takes to that. I think, and they feel like they're a part of the show. Even being fans, even buying a ticket and paid admission, they feel like they're as much a part of the show. And that's the special feeling I think they get is that they know that they're not coming to watch a play; they're coming to be interactive with us. What about the injury factor in the game, Joey? How many times and have you been hurt since the year two thousand? Um, lucky for me, and I'm going to knock on wood right now, I've never broken anything, but that's very common, you know, bones break. You know, DDP, uh, Diamond Dallas Page, who's a very famous professional wrestler, had a great quote that I use a lot, which is, uh, you can't fake gravity. You know, just because I, you know, just because I tell you that I'm going to pick you up and throw you on the ground doesn't mean it's going to hurt any less when I do it. So, you know, there's definitely a risk factor. I've, I've had pulled muscles, um, uh, you know, I've had, I guess, I guess, I, I think I, I've deviated septum, so maybe I had a broken nose, but I never had it officially diagnosed. Um, so I guess that counts as a broken bone, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's just definitely like wear, wear and tear, you know, sore, stiffness in the neck and back and things like that. And, uh, um, but I've been very lucky, lucky, you know, I, I, with my career, I haven't had too many bad injuries. I haven't had to cancel too many. I mean, I've had a concussion. That was probably my worst thing. And I guess probably, that with what little we know about concussions, probably is maybe the worst thing you can get because a lot of those obviously you don't want to deal with but um yeah i mean like i said there's definitely a factor and you know a lot of guys just try to train and stay in shape and you know a lot of times people look at wrestling and that you know we all look like bodybuilders because that's part of the uh you know part of the look or part of the um aesthetic of the show but in in, in a certain way it is but a lot of times you know you want to be in shape and you want to um, you know, at least be conditioned because it, is, it does take a toll on your body. In light of that topic, Joey, what about drugs in the sports, the steroids? How rampant is steroid use in professional wrestling? Uh, I have had to deal with it too much on, on love and business. Um, I mean, I'm sure that I, I wouldn't know to put a point finger at, and um, I'm, I'm hoping at least with, uh, you know, uh, WWE implementing the wellness policy, and I think that helps a lot on, on the independent level, too, is that um, you know, if you looked at if you look at wrestlers from the '80s to even the '90s to now, um, there's definitely there's not as many like huge giant. But I mean, everyone's in shape and, and, and looks athletic, but there's not as many bodybuilder types. So um, hopefully, because you know, with, when they t- came under scrutiny for the, the right use and things like that, they implemented that wellness policy and their drug testing and things like that. So I think when the top level, which is WWE, sets a standard, it kind of drops down to all the different levels in the industry and, and everyone follows suit. You know, they set the pace and everybody follows suit. So, like I said, if you notice, if you watch the programming, um, you know, if you pop in a tape from the 90s, to pop in a tape from last week, you'll notice that the guys are a little bit more lean, a little bit, um, you know, they're like so still athletic, but not as bodybuilder looking. Um, and I, you know, I think because they set the standard, it kind of, it's kind of maybe lessened over these. I'm sure there's still guys that are doing it. In, I mean, I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there's guys in baseball and football that are still doing it, too, even though they get tested. There's always somebody who can come up with a way to get around it, um, but around testing and things like that. But um, I think for the most part, the, the, the degree of use has is, is dropped tremendously since the 80s and 90s. There's an acceptance now of the smaller wrestler that wasn't around then. The, yeah, the, a, lot of fans like to, a lot of fans like to see the, the more athleticism rather than you know, like the the larger than life guy who just you know punches and kicks and beats down those guys. I think uh, the wrestling fan has grown a little bit where that's kind of boring to them. Actually, you don't just want to see the large guys just you know beat up. Like, I mean, there's always going to be that degree in wrestling, but I think a lot of wrestling fans have kind of taken to more smaller guys who are a little bit more athletic and can move a little better and and do a lot more um, creative things. You know, whether it's more like a you know a, a gymnastic event or a stunt show. But I think people are taking. I don't think anybody buys into the fact that it's real. I don't think anybody thinks that what we're doing out there is a real competition. And so once they've accepted that and they accept what we're doing as a show, they're more inclined to, to like the more like the more it looks like a stunt show or the more uh, you know gymnastics aspect we can put in it because they want to be amazed by what they see. It's like a circus. You want to see. You want to be amazed at, the, at you know, your eyes. Want to be amazed. Yeah, I call. I think it's a little bit. I always call it. So you think you can dance with violence. It's a it's kind of a mixture of a lot of athleticism with a little bit of extra violence thrown in for you know the people who would whet that appetite like I am. I 
I can I can't go to a strip so you think you can dance taping. Although I appreciate the athletics of the dancers, but I I really you know PWG is my favorite thing every month, and I, you know the ten times they run, I'll be there. I changed my schedule some trips to Saratoga based on PWG. <laughs> um, and it was good to see a PWG staple make his Monday Night Raw debut yesterday. Did you watch that, Joey? I, I haven't yet. Uh, it's on my DVR, but I haven't watched it. But I, I heard about it. I read about it online. So yeah, a couple, right. actually. Uh, cause, Pac, too. Uh, right. Pac, Pac and Generic, yeah. who are, which was their names in PWG. They have different names in WWE now, but... Um, for a lot of years, they wrestled in PWG, and now they're in, you know, and, 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 and you know, smaller guys. And at one point in wrestling, might have been considered too small to be in WWE, but they were on Monday Night Raw this week. That was a more than a smattering of the OLA chance for Generico too, which was great. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with Alan Dinkinson. Our featured guest tonight is Joey Ryan, professional wrestler from Southern California who will be here in Las Vegas. On Saturday, he'll be appearing at the Las Vegas Roller Hockey Center, 953 East Sahara. Tickets for that show, just $20 at the door. Dink is the promoter, part of Quintessential Pro Wrestling. We hope to get that promotion off the ground here in Las Vegas. It would be great to have regular shows in Las Vegas so you didn't have to travel out. Uh, I'd still be traveling. Well, you would be, but uh, (laughs) others might not. John made the. You've been to two PWs. Oh, I thought it was fabulous. Uh, The athleticism, the the humor. I like the humor part. Uh, And Joey, you are a showman. Uh, That that's the beauty of watching Joey Ryan in the ring. He can do it both. He's both a wrestler and a showman. And Joey, two quick stories from my youth. I grew up in uh, suburban Chicago, so I watched the wrestling in the AWA era. Uh, Vern Gagne, uh, I think, was in charge of that promotion. He was the champion for a time. But then Nick Bockwinkle came in, took over for Gagne. Bockwinkle had a an act. I mean, he was he was a smart guy, interviewed well. He was kind of the smart, sophisticated wrestler. And he had the, what always amazed me with Bachwinkle is he'd come into the ring and the first minute or two, he'd absolutely be exhausted from, you know, the, the first minute or two of action. So he'd play, you know, he played tired the whole match, which was fascinating yeah. to watch. And then on, on uh, outside the ring, he had Bobby Heenan in his corner, you know, and Heenan was a manager at the time. He's, I think, started out uh, in that uh, Chicago, Indianapolis area, and what I remember of Bobby Heenan, he had that uh, bleached blonde hair, and he would cut himself. He'd bleed. He was a bleeder, and you know to see that red blood against the white hair, you know, it really. And they had Dick the Bruiser and the Crusher, kind of as the you know the good guys, the faces in Chicago at the time. But Bachwinkle and Heenan, Joey, were two of my favorites. That's probably a little bit before your time. I mean, I totally I know of them and watched their tapes and stuff when I got into it. But yeah, like. They're a little bit before my my growing up days. Uh, do you bleed? Uh, have you cut yourself? Um, when the story's right, I, I don't. I'm not against it. Uh, you know, I, if it makes sense. Um, I mean, like I'll do anything that makes sense in the story. Like you said, I'm a showman, and I like to tell stories with my wrestling. And if it if it's going to add to the story, like I certainly don't mind it. You bled a good friend of ours out of the uh, PWG arena when you. Yeah, some <laughs> some people don't really like to 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 see the blood, but. You know, I think I think in wrestling, especially the way we present it, there's a time and a place in it. Yeah. It'd be like we're talking it'd be about like a movie. Gillian Jacobs, who was mortified of there wasn't that much of a blading job either. That you know, she kind of stopped her coming back for a long time, <laughs> which is interesting. Yeah, and I think I think sometimes, like you know, in movies, like sometimes, you know, they're you know, they, there's obviously it's makeup and done like that, but we don't have that luxury of being able to sit in a makeup chair for that long so we kind of have to uh improvise or you know at least do it on the spot and and uh i mean not not saying improvise like it wasn't planned but we have to um you know find a way to to get it out there because it does add to the story just like in a movie if there's bleeding in a movie it's definitely there's it's been written into the script for a reason i think the most famous bleeding from pwg happened in when you won the tag team belts yeah just a couple months ago Joey, your love of the L.A. Angels, how did that come about? It was, it was more my dad's, uh, to be honest with you. Like, we, we I grew up actually closer to the Dodgers, but, or to the, closer to Dodger Stadium in L.A., um, but my dad was always an uh, American League guy, and he liked the Angels. Um, you know, when I was younger, I kind of took to, uh, like, the A's, like the 89-90 with McGuire and Conseco, because they were larger than, larger than life. They looked like pro wrestlers to me, you know, like, they were like, uh, you know, the cool Bass Brothers. They're kind of, they're kind of like the NWO of the day, you know. They were for baseball, anyways, you know. And so I kind of took to the, to the Oakland A's a little bit. But then when, um, you know, that broke apart, I got a little bit older. I, I kind of wanted to, to get into a team that I was was more local to me, and I could go to their games, and I could, you know, go cheer them on. 
And, uh, and you know, my dad, like I said, my dad was always an Angels fan, so I could go to the games with him and take him to the games. And we just kind of prefer, I guess, American League style of baseball more and, and the Angel Stadium a little bit more than Dodger Stadium. So um, that was really our only reasoning for picking the Angels over the Dodgers. And, again, you know, it brings me fond memories of, you know, my dad and I going to games when I was when I was younger, getting to see, like, Wally Joyner playing, guys like that from the Angels. And now, you know, obviously getting to see, like, Mike Trout play. And, like, as you mentioned, even Garrett Richards just have an unbelievable year this year. Um, just getting to kind of experience the new team. So I mean, just growing up with it. Joey is so passionate about baseball that he did something. He tried out for something two years ago that really, yeah. When I first heard about it, I was amazed, and I know, and I consider Joey a friend. So, you want to talk about that experience? Uh, yeah, you know, I was, was the first season of the MLB Fan Cave, um, which was which is cool because it was a, uh, it's a, it's a, essentially a journalist job, like because you watch baseball all day and you write about it and you blog about it and you put it on. It's like a show that. It's like a TV show, but they have it like on the internet um, on MLB.com. That's a branch of MLB.com, and so I really like wasn't qualified to be on it, but I, because I'm such a big fan, I, I put out for you know, and they they liked the character and they liked that I came from wrestling and that I was a showman. So I actually made it into the top. Uh, was, it, was it top 40? 20, mm-hmm. 20, How many? I think. How many did they take? Yeah, I mean, they think they, they ended up taking like eight or nine. Um, you were right I on like, the bubble, top, yeah. You were, yeah, so I, I, they took the top But again, it's a, it was a writer's job, so I think they, they they liked the idea and they wanted me, but when it came down to it, they like, not that I can't write a blog, but I think that they went with people who had like uh, college education, college degrees in, that, in, in writing and, and things like that, and journalism and stuff. Like guys who had experience at newspapers and stuff like that is who they ended up taking, which, but it was cool because they, you know, they flew me down to Arizona and I got to take, part in spring training and I got to interview players and you know like I got to actually be on the scene with everybody which was cool I went to the the Brewers um, um, camp and got to interview some of the guys and take pictures and things like that and kind of be a reporter for the day at the Brewers spring training camp that's my favorite stadium Maryville it's just yeah. small enough to be cool and, and big enough to be nice yeah and, um, and, 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 and I interviewed John Axford at the time he was on the Brewers. It was it was really cool. He ruined his career. It used to be good. <laughs> yeah, I right. was a kiss of death for him. And the Brewers are in the tank right now. They've lost four straight. They're they're up. You could basically I say think they've lost ten out of eleven. Now. Ten of eleven, six back now in the National League Central. At one point, they were cruising. Now the over under batters have to worry. They're dropping they're kind of, faster than the, the A's. Kind of the A's of the I knew you kind of mentioned the A's. The A's. The A's. Yeah. NL Central, huh? So how come the Angels are playing so well when they lost their best pitcher and probably their second best player and maybe their best, one of the best pitchers in baseball? Well, uh, yeah, they did. They definitely did, obviously. Um, with seven starts left, though, so really he was... I mean, obviously he was going to affect those games heavily, and I think, they, I think they've won two out of the three that he missed. With their bullpen has been so great lately, and that's probably why they're winning so much. Is their bullpen has been so strong, but in the grand scheme of the season, he only had seven games left to pitch, and you know, seven games is a lot. But you just got to find a way to win those. And like they've they've won two of those three that he was going to affect. Um, it's probably going to be a little bit more of a blow to feel in the playoffs yeah, when you have sure. to match up against other aces. You know, you, you you can't you can't mix and match a bullpen for a game when you're going up against you know Felix Hernandez or so whoever else is going to play in the playoffs. You know, or David Price or whoever else. You know, you can't mix and match a bullpen to go up against those guys. So you're really going to miss uh, your top pitcher. You know, in in those games. So you just got to hope for the best. Um, and you know, hopefully those those games won't be as as effective to the series as, as affecting of the series as you know as as they can be. But like I said, the, the, he was only really going to affect seven more games this season. The postseason is probably when they're going to feel a little bit more. If you had your choice, what what would be the three teams in what order would you like to play them? You have to play uh, the, the wild card. Who would you want to avoid and who would you want to play? Um, Jeez. Uh, I feel like the Angels always do fairly decent against Detroit. Um, I feel like they... At least lately, as of like, like the tough time, but with the A's for most of the season, but they'll, you know, they handled them pretty good this last time around, but they're always kind of scary, that rivalry. Um, 
I, I'm really scared of Baltimore. I think Baltimore plays them real hard, and I don't think they've had very much success against Baltimore in recent recent time. Um, and Baltimore obviously looks like they're going to win the AL East, so that 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 team scares me a little bit. Well, Baltimore but, um, will probably have to play either Oakland or Seattle, I would imagine. Yeah, and the yeah. team that I loses th- I like, Central, I think, will lose the uh, wild card. Yeah, I feel like um, um, they play. Like I, said, I feel like they play Detroit okay. Um, I feel like I feel, I feel like they play Seattle okay. Um, they definitely seem to play Oakland okay. They just swept them. Yeah, but like that, I, th- I think that's like if you. I think even sweeping Oakland this last four game set, I think Oakland still is winning the season series. So Oakland is a little bit of a mystery. Um, well, they're in the tank they're on, for sure. That might be a right. Good time right. To they're reeling. Them. They're reeling right now. They're reeling right now. I think. Um, you know, I think without the presence of Cespedes in the lineup really hurt them, or at least hurt their team chemistry or something, because that seemed to be when they started falling falling a little bit is when they when they traded Cespedes, Cespedes away, who's, you know, a 250 hitter, so it's not like he was raking. Um, so but maybe the team chemistry or just the presence in the lineup um, is, is what's hurting them now, and I think that maybe they're trying to replace that with Adam Dunn, but I think I don't know if that's really, I mean... It, to me, that seems the Adam Dunn move seems a little bit out of desperation because Adam Dunn doesn't really seem like a Billy Dean type of player. You know, the, all the unproductive outs with the strikeouts doesn't really seem like. So it looks like they're kind of grasping at straws with him. But if they can find a way to put their ke- team chemistry back together um, with the loss of Cespedes, then they can be scary again because when they're on, they're really good. They're almost unbeatable when they're on. Um, it's just like I said, they're reeling right now. So hopefully. You know, hopefully they don't put it back together before, you know, if the Angels have to play them. But, uh, yeah, like I said, Baltimore's probably the scariest team for, for me right now. They're another um, overachieving team, both Baltimore and the Angels. Are the most, a yeah, but they always play, it seems like they always play the Angels hard. And it seems like, like even not even just the season, but like the season's past, I think I feel like they, they, they have a much better record against the Angels than the Angels have against them. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly and Ellen Dinkinson. Our featured guest tonight is Joey Ryan, professional wrestler from Southern California. He'll be here in Las Vegas Saturday for the QPW card, this quintessential pro wrestling. That's Dink's promotion. The event takes place Saturday night at the Las Vegas Roller Hockey Center. Doors open 7.30, first bout at 8 o'clock, $20 to get in, 9.53 East Sahara. You missed it last week, Joey, when Dink was on, and I was telling him that the QPW card goes right up against the Mayweather-Maidana fight at the MGM Grand Garden Arena. The irony when Dink said, don't uh, go to the boxing, come to the wrestling, because we know what's going to happen in the boxing. Uh, Maidana will chase Mayweather, Mayweather will back up, defend himself, counterpunch, and Mayweather will earn uh, a, a boring decision. A boring decision. Uh, the, the irony of a pro wrestling promoter telling us how a boxing match would transpire made me laugh. I think the fans that, that will is- know what to get if they go there and pay three hundred dollars more than if they come to my show and then that is a good point though <laughs> because I feel like you know like obviously there's been a popular popular like a popularity uh, uh growth for like m m a but I don't feel like m m a will over ever overtake wrestling because wrestling can always put on a show, so if you buy a wrestling pay per view you always know that you're gonna get a show uh they're gonna go above and beyond to give you a show but a, you know, a UFC card, even though they can put their great fights, they can end in an instant. So sometimes you'll pay for a UFC fight. And the same thing applies to boxing. You know, like there's certain things that like you you, you don't always know that the, the you don't always know that you're going to get something good or entertaining at least out of a boxing fight sure. or an MMA fight. But it could end in an instant, and you could be you could pay fifty bucks to watch a guy get knocked out thirteen seconds into a fight. Or you know, you, you could pay five hundred bucks for, or twenty five hundred <laughs> right, bucks if you go. If you go yeah, if you if you go to uh, uh, to see it live, you know, like you may you know, not get your money's worth at any boxing event. You'll always get your money's worth. At a, at a good independent or professional wrestling card. And the good example there is Mike Tyson when the first round knockouts were going on. Yeah, I mean, people understand that that's what you know is capable of happening and they want to see one of the best boxers. But there's a lot of undercard matches that are just hard to watch because it's so slow, especially the, the heavyweight division now. It's just very difficult for me to enjoy. And I was never a boxing guy, but in my heyday of Ali and Norton and Frazier and Foreman, and, and Chevallo, and you know, there was always an interesting fight on the horizon. I can't even think of an interesting fight except the one that will never happen: Pacquiao and Mayweather. And 
Yeah, you know, I just it's not that interesting. And MMA has taken the WCW approach of, well, let's get on the air as much as we can and we'll dilute our product so that there's seven undercard matches that I've never heard of anybody and maybe a good featured match. And the most over person now, just like in, in my show, which is a women's champion, I think in MMA is Ronda Rousey. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that a woman is probably the most talked about because... She is consistently putting on great matches and living up to the hype. And the UFC has a way of, you know, having their champion lose and a new champion and then another and another and another. And uh, I think that they're not marketing that many stars. That's the voice of Alan Dinkinson. I'm John Kelly. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. Just a couple of minutes left with Joey Ryan. I want to ask Joe who he thinks the rotation will be in the playoffs for the Angels. Who the rotation will be? Yeah, I know. We um, know Weaver, but after that, I'm... Weaver will be one. Weaver... <sighs> I'm going to say Schumacher right now would be number two starter because just because he's been more consistent than C.J. Wilson. I think they'll slot C.J. Wilson. In, unless they want to break up the lefties. Um, I could see them doing Weaver, Wilson, Schumacher, and then Santiago. I think they'll go with the four-man. You think they'll use Santiago and and Wilson? Boy, that's scary to me, especially Wilson. Well, Santiago hasn't been that. He, he's been pretty consistent. Yeah, you know, he's he's almost a five. His records don't. So he was, I think at one point in the season he was like one and six, and now he's like five and seven. So his last few starts have been pretty quality. Um, so I think Santiago definitely slots in it at the, at the fourth. And I think they'll go with the four-man rotation because the, the extra days. I can't see Wilson. Off Can you see Wilson pitching well? He hasn't pitched well. He gives up more hits per inning in every start. He's a bit shaky. Uh, he, he has he has his on days and his off days. Um, obviously, I, I watch most of the games, and sometimes when he's on, he's on. But he's he's such a nibbler at the plate that like he ends up walking guys and throwing a ton of pitches, and he's he's just almost a hundred pitches after five or six innings. So it's hard to like get him deep into a game because um, he nibbles so much at the plate. Um, and like, if he's, it's, actually, a lot of his starts depend on if the umpire's calling strikes or not. You know, if he's a if he's a pitcher's ump and he's calling a wide strike zone, then CJ Wilson can go like an Avery can, can type, a, Steve Avery. Yeah, can have a quality start. So a lot of his starts are dependent on what the strike zone the umpire's given him. Um, so, you know, it depends. I, I mean, I definitely think that they have to without without Garrett Richards. I think they those are their four guys. You know, that's Weaver, Wilson, Schumacher, and um, and Santiago. But. Uh, where they slot to depend, it's like I said, depends on if they want to break the lefties up or not. If they, if they want to, because like, obviously Schumacher's pitching uh, a little bit more consistent than than Weaver. Might or, depend know, on who they're now. who they're playing, I guess, and what kind of right could they have. could also depend on that. Have you well, given up your your dislike of your manager? You've hated him for years. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, I I think that he changed the way he managed when because I, I I watched the, the beginning of the season obviously, and I, I thought he was. You know, leaving pitchers in a little bit too long, and 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 they were getting rocked in the late innings, seventh, eighth, when they should have been taken out. But obviously, he didn't really have the bullpen he has now. And now that Jerry Depoto has gone out and got him a better bullpen, he's you know he's he's a little bit quick hook. And in this, because of the bullpen's consistency, I think that he you know is able to manage a little bit better game. So you know, I, I think it's definitely a team effort. And you know, and God that Depoto went out and got him a better bullpen. No trouble with the Angels right now. They're on cruise control in the American League West. But the trouble with Angels, an eight-woman tournament, wrestling tournament, is taking place this Saturday in Las Vegas. Quintessential Pro Wrestling Las Vegas Roller Hockey Center is the place. $20 at the door. We hope to see you there. Dink will be there, of course, overseeing the entire operation. I'll be in the crowd watching the action. Joey will be in the ring. Should be a lot of fun. Joey, do you know your opponent this Saturday? No, he doesn't. Um, <laughs> no, he doesn't. He thinks no, he knows, I don't. but that's uh, it's been, yeah. it's been I mean, thrown I mean, about. I mean, I, the promoter uh, keeps changing his mind of uh, how to book this show. But I, yeah, I think Joey's I, opponent I mean, will be interesting. Could, initially, I was booking the tag team match, but I, I, I feel like that has since changed. So on the flyer, I'm in a tag team match, but I don't, I don't I, feel I like that. I think we're going to uh, keep Rock Ness together to wrestle um, Los Luchas, which will be a fun match. I, and we'll yeah, have, we have a place for Joey elsewhere. That'll be fun. It'll be interesting when I show up and find out what I'm doing. Okay, good. Joey, thanks for the time tonight. Really appreciate it. Good luck uh, with your wrestling career, and uh, uh, stay safe. Thanks, Joey. I'll see you Saturday. Thank you. 
Joey Ryan on the program. We'll step aside, take the only time out of the program. When we return, we'll devote the last 15 minutes of the show to Dink's football handicapping. He's got a red uh, folder in front of him. (laughs) NFL 2014. We'll ask him what he saw in week one of the National Football League season and what he might see coming up in week two. We'll ask him for a play or two when we return here on the EOG Sports Hour. There's no such thing as a sure thing, unless you're talking about Ion Gaming. Ion Gaming is a website dedicated to the hearts and minds of sports bettors everywhere. If you're looking for smart, sophisticated sports handicapping information and insight, go to EOG.com. If you're looking for the latest news, the ever-changing landscape of Nevada's race and sportsbook industry, go to EOG. If you're looking for the most recent developments involving the worldwide sports betting scene with an emphasis on the leading sports books in San Jose, Costa Rica, go to EOG.com. And finally, if you're looking to join an online community of sports gamblers where registration is free and the information is priceless, go to EOG.com. You get the idea. Why gamble on other sports betting websites when I on gaming is a sure thing? And I love a sure thing. Hi, this is Rick Alec, president of Sports Options. Sports Options is a sports information tool designed to give sports bettors of all types the necessary edge needed to improve their bottom line. With Sports Options, you'll never lay a bad number again. We provide you with live odds from the leading sports books in the world, from Costa Rica to Curacao, London to Las Vegas, and everywhere in between. Sports Options also provides the fastest and most accurate injury information, lightning quick score updates, and game analysis from 30-year handicapping veteran Mark Simons. We offer affordable services for players of all levels, starting at just $99 per month. To see which service best fits your needs, you can take advantage of our 7-day free trial. No credit card is needed. Just go to www.sportsoptions.com and click on the free trial link. I'm confident you'll be impressed with our product and you'll find it the most complete and comprehensive on the market. In fact, if you don't like sports options after 30 days, we'll refund you 100% of your subscription costs, no questions asked. Go to sportsoptions.com for all the details or call 702-835-1743 and one of our friendly customer service representatives will be happy to help you. Sports Options, information you can bet on. And we are back. The EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with Alan Dingenson on a Tuesday night. Joey Ryan, we want to thank him for his appearance on the program. He'll be here Saturday for Dink's wrestling promotion. Eight lovely young ladies. Interesting time. The website we can visit to find out more information. Uh, Facebook, Quintessential Pro Wrestling. Um, and this, if you YouTube, you'll see some past matches, including some of the girls in action, too. You and I were on opposite sides of a baseball game tonight. You got the money in Toronto. 9-2, the Blue Jays beat the Cubs. I was under the total of 8. You were over the total of... 7.5 flat when it got there. I, I was neutral to 8. I wasn't going to play, but after three hits, I was forced to play. That's the way I am. If I'm dead neutral and game moves a good number, I'm betting the other side. And you know, I, I'd rather bet the good number and then see it move. But I will be willing to take the last number and then make the wager. The beauty about taking last numbers, as my buddy uh, Kevin Kelly likes to say, is you you can or uh, Ken Kelly, Ken, Kenny the cop, you can always get the best of it. You know, it, when you take the last number, you can be sure that that's the. If absolute you can buy the opposite, <laughs> right? Uh, There's a lot of people movie. who you know think people know something and. I, uh, when I was a bookmaker, they you know game would open four. They would call and then they ask you the game was four and a half, and then they hang up and then they call back and say what's the game now and five. Okay, I lay five for two thousand. I go, well, what happened to four and four and a half? And they'll say, well, I guess smart people are betting the game. So that that was their strategy, and for a while it actually worked in college basketball when you know the days of the computer winning at sixty five percent or so. Mm-hmm. But they, those people are long gone. Those that- bad numbers are long gone. Back to the Cubs-Jays game, I'm not going to say it was a bad beat, but certainly it was tough to stomach. 2-1 Cubs, bottom seven. I'm looking good at under eight. Toronto hits me with a three spot in the seventh. I can survive that, but the five spot in the bottom of the eighth kills you. And, you know, what's what happens sometimes in September baseball, think you don't know who's crawling out of the bullpens uh, right, this time right. of year. That, that once the game gets out of hand, 
they're bringing in the guys they want to see or well the game is 5-1 and we don't we're not fighting for the pen and so we'll bring in the absolute of the last call-ups to finish out the game and we're not taking him out either um so that happens it's a, almost like spring training theory they want to see what the kids got and they'll do it at the expense of betters our friend of course if the game stayed 3-1 they wouldn't have done that it's, you know, but once it got a little out of hand, then then they're committed to just watching people pitch. And it's a whole different attitude. You get caught up in a lot of stuff when you bet totals. Totals, totals are made for bad beats. Totals are made for bad beats. I like that line. You're right. And uh, in football, turnovers oftentimes make the total. You know, good or bad. Uh, you know, turnovers make everything in football. Special teams and turnovers yeah. usually determine the outcome of a game. Now, in the long run, you. Can, I, I I don't believe the people say that all turnovers are arbitrary. I think bad teams turn the ball over more, and bad quarterbacks turn the ball over more. And uh, is, fumbles you, are, are also people you you always hear announcers say, "Oh, he's prone to fumble," or he's this is the first fumble in four years. So there's obviously a turnover mm-hmm. statistic too. Like if you had mm-hmm. team with the most turnovers as a prop, you can probably do well if everything was pick a minus ten. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with Alan Dinkinson. I That's wanted to me. tip my cap to uh, EOG contributor Hustle Double. He's our participant in this month's EOG Grand Challenge, trying to win $1,000 by hitting 60% of his 30 plays, one play a day. His play today, under at City Field. Easy Mets, winner. Mets no two. heartbreak in that game. No, Rockies nothing. That's the way to do it. DeGrom and Bergman hooked up in the duel there, so a job well done by Hustle double. I had a nice winner in baskets. Uh, WNBA total went over. Uh, there was money to the over, too. I went over 154.5, closed 157 at Chris. Phoenix bombs Chicago 97 to 68. It's a one sided tournament, uh, one sided playoffs. Huh? Uh-huh. Is the girl uh, Della Donna? Is that her? Yeah, she's not 100%. Bad oh, back. She's she, yeah, with suffering with Lyme, Lyme disease. Lyme disease. And, That's yeah. scary. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't even know what it was before. Uh, she contracted it, and I read, yes, up, read up about it. from having too much lemon lime soda. Is that right? <laughs> How did your football weekend go, Dink? It went well, except for my biggest bet was on Jacksonville, which was a heartbreak. Mm. But it went really well. I had a really good Sunday. I don't know why. You know, numbers I picked off held up. My opinions, for the most part, held up. I tend to play dogs earlier in the season because I'm not sure if I'm. I'm usually. As the season rolls around, things expectations are switched, and uh, I was willing to play against m- mediocre or poor teams who were favorites. I got lucky with Cleveland. Um, most of the other games weren't that lucky. What's My tra- totals that I bet under held up, so it doesn't seem like it's lucky, but they are because sometimes you'll get a, a fluke touchdown followed by a kickoff return or something. Usually I'm on the wrong end of those, and I was on the wrong end of the worst beat, with Jacksonville, but most of my other games held up with leads. What's your thought on this, Dink? Jacksonville led Philadelphia at the half, 17 nothing. Philly then outscores Jacksonville, 34 nothing in the second half. So it was 17 unanswered for Jacksonville, 34 unanswered for Philadelphia. Do you think moving forward that's a productive game or an unproductive one? When you get a well, lo- certainly to me it's unproductive for Philadelphia because they got their butts handed to them in the first half legit. The comeback was a little bit of Jacksonville probably shelling and then nonsense at the end where they got the ball on, you know, on, on, their, on the Jacksonville 25 with like a minute, two minutes or three minutes left on downs, kicked a field goal running out the clock and then had a fumble six. So I wouldn't give them any credit for those 10 points at all. So they really kind of won the game uh, by, I don't think, uh, seven. That was the legitimate final of that game, and then beating Jacksonville by seven when Jacksonville was playing that second half semi prevent. I, I downgrade my Philly a little, I, but I downgraded a lot of teams after week one. Yeah, and it, God, did the, some teams look terrible. The mm-hmm. Giants look hopeless. Now, I've seen this team too many times of looking hopeless and then looking really good, and then everybody says they're coming around, and then they go right into two hopeless games again. But Oakland could not run the ball. Yeah, I expect very little mm. of Oakland. Kansas right? City at home laid an egg. They're not the quality team either. It's just... The Bears aren't who we thought they were. I guess not. I, I'll tell you what. I, I, I know this every year, and I'm going to say it after game week one again. 
if you look back after week seven, there's so many things that you learned incorrectly from week one, and the teams that are good become good, and some teams that are bad who won in week one and you thought they were better are absolute garbage. Uh, so I don't like to base – I think everybody bases week two too much on week one, mm-hmm. and that's a bit of a trap. You know, you're going to bet against teams that look crappy and you bet on teams that look good. That's the nature of everybody's philosophy, but there's a number for that. And I think there's a little bit of too many points in the numbers when you see a dead team play a live team, especially when the dead team wasn't supposed to be that dead. You're listening to the EOG Sports Hour. John Kelly with Alan Dinkinson. Want to say hello to EOG contributor Boucher. He's listening to the program tonight. He's He's thinking uh, of getting that hockey tournament together. Yeah, the first ever sanctioned NHL regular season contest at EOG. It'll be a lot of fun. I'll be the commissioner. That sounds good to handle all the rules and disputes because there can be some $100 entry. What lines are you going to use? How are you going to do that with money lines in hockey? Uh, Boucher was talking about the midnight line at Pinnacle. Uh, going to use the lines that are available at Penny, at Midnight Eastern. So, Wait a minute. So Midnight Eastern, 9 p.m., when do you have to have your bet in? I think uh, you have until the puck drops, if I'm God, I think most people will be playing advantage. Mm-hmm. The game is pick them and then goes to 30, and you can only pick them with the team that's now 30. Yeah. I know WVU will be on. <laughs> and he's in it. In fact, he's the defending champion, even though this well, is the course. first <laughs> ever probably sanctioned probably rules event. like that. Yeah, Boucher held in a... A similar That's a tough year. call. I, I would almost, uh, I would say you have to bet within the last before the last hour before four o'clock Pacific, and the lines open at three o'clock Pacific. You have one hour to be, make your plays and put them in, mm-hmm. so the line won't deviate that much. And so, too many people can just play the pure deviations. Also, a lot of people have, have written, "Why isn't Dink challenging Railbird?" I, I like to do the, the, my head-to-head on Tuesday, and I don't know if John wants to do two contests in a week, but I'm open for anybody who wants to play me against the Tuesday number, which I think is a better test of skill than playing against a number that's pretty wide, widely available, especially with you know people looking for that juice edge. That juice edge on Tuesday when it's 2.5 and, and 20 isn't that good anymore when the game closes, pick them. Let's fire that up. Uh, how about the first Tuesday in October? I'll um, whatever you want. Sounds good. Uh, great. The Dink handicapping pro and I think college you should football every Tuesday. Brock just for the one tournament. <laughs> you want to create trouble? Actually, no, we've I done a good, make a thousand. We've done a good job. I, I I like what's happening the last couple of days, especially. Um, at EOG, I think we're getting some of the smart, sophisticated guys back. When I see guys like Drink Your Milkshake or Panther Man, I like what James D. brings to the table. I am mentioning names because I'll, I'll miss a few. People, yeah. Discreet Cat and Two Win, Two Place, Two Show. Guys. A lot of horse guys. Yeah, Ray Luka. Horse guy, try to get Mazel Trick to post again. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. And we're going to have a Breeders' Cup competition. $1,000 in the kitty, a free shot to uh, 20 of our best EOG horse players. Paul Bovey is a great horse player. Nedro 9 likes to play the pony scrimmage and many others. So a uh, lot's happening at EOG. You can check out the main forum. Free to register and fun to participate. Dink going head-to-head in the month of October, beginning the first Tuesday in October. He'll accept some challenges. Things didn't go that well for you last year, Dink. No, they did not. Yeah, that'll happen. Well, it's not my specialty, but it was disappointing. I you know, I, I put some thought into it. I'm not randomly picking games. About two minutes remaining. Uh, Dink, I'll go on record quickly with a play in Major League Baseball. I cannot pass up James Shields as a dog in that big game tomorrow at Comerica against Porcello. Big game James is his reputation. He's solid on the road, too. That's what I like about the uh, the Royals' critical spot. I'm going to go with Shields plus a dollar five or thereabouts. See if you can get plus a dollar ten. The Kansas City Royals over the Detroit Tigers. It's betting number nine sixty nine. Dink, do you have a player two that you've made? Yeah, I'll give one play in each sport. I'm, I'm, I played Washington over seven. I'm not sure if the line is still seven. I, I played this a long time ago uh, with Strasburg and Harang. Harang has hit the wall and he's become the pitcher he's supposed to be in Strasburg. Is uh, is a lot under the radar because of Verlander, I think, but he's been pretty disappointing straight through. And the uh, the Washington's hitting again, so I expect them to score. And I'd rather, like you said, I'd rather not lay the price on Strasburg. I'd rather go over because I do think the strength in this game is the hitting of Washington and not the pitching of either team. And in football, 
I'm going to try to find my week two sheet where I have a bet on a line that's still current. Uh, oh, I know what I like. I like um, Penn State over 53. I bet it over 52. Penn State Rutgers over 53. You that's got a fi- milkshake dink agreement game. <laughs> You've got over 52 in pocket. It's 53 now and still good. I think it's still very good. Uh, Penn State's reputation for playing to conservative games that no longer exist. Game 191-192, Penn State and Rutgers over the total. And my other play 50. for football totals is Bowling Green over 69. Bowling Green over 69, easy number to remember. For you, perhaps. For, me. for Ellen Dinkinson, <laughs> I'm John Kelly. Thanks for listening.